Thank you everyone for joining today's webinar on flexible low volume continuous oxidation injections for low permeable and challenging environments. My name is Dylan Kemmer. I am our key account manager with Keras, one of our remediation sales reps. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome Paul Grusha and John Yurton with Weaver Consultants Group. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we begin the, the webinar. Uh, first, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, you can enter them through the GoToWebinars question pane over on the right. We will monitor those throughout the presentation and we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, additionally, there are some supporting document handouts in the handout section. So if you look underneath the questions, there should be a handout. You can download those at your leisure uh, as needed. So some quick bios. Paul and John are integral members with Weaver Consultants Group Remediation Services. Weaver's Remediation Services provides turnkey solutions for environmental liabilities from design through self-improvement with focus on efficiency, optimization, and innovative approaches to accelerate remedial timelines and reduce overall project costs. They have successfully implemented their remediational strategies and obtained closure in over 150 plus sites across the country on behalf of DOD and their contractors, municipalities, insurance carriers, and large and small corporate clients. The remediation service teams is currently implementing a number of in situ soil and groundwater remediation programs for commingled and chlorinated solvent plumes, utilizing a variety of remediational technologies, such as soil vapor extraction, air sparge, sub slab depressurization, enhanced reductive dechlorination, in situ chemical oxidation, in situ chemical reduction, and carbon based trap and treat, as well as pump and treat systems and permeable enhancement through hydraulic and explosive fracturing. John serves as a senior project director, operations manager for Weaver Remediation Services. He is an accomplished geologist, remediation specialist, and experienced project manager with over 23 years of experience. Mr. Yurton has gained the trust of private, government, and corporate clients through practical approaches to project management, innovation, strategic planning of remediation strategies, and effective client agency negotiations. He is adept at providing demonstrative time straight savings that accelerate project completions and favorable outcomes while reducing overall project costs. Paul serves as a senior project manager with Weaver with over 13 years of professional experience in conducting and managing a wide variety of environmental and construction projects. At petroleum and hazardous substance contaminated sites, he joined remediation, Weaver Remediation Services in 2019, along with consulting and remediation experience from the Chicago office. Paul has considerable experience in a wide variety of environmental focuses and has navigated projects through the regulatory environments of 14 states in the Midwest, West, Northeast, and South on behalf of private and public corporate clients, Fortune 500 companies, municipalities, and DOD entities. Thank you, Dylan. So thank you both for Thank you, Dylan. Appreciate that. Appreciate everybody joining our discussion today. Thank you, guys. Uh, first, we're going to start the presentation off with a quick poll. So I'm going to bring that up here. And this will be for the attendees, if you don't mind answering that poll for us. All right, answers are coming in. We'll give it a little bit more here. All right, it looks like most answers are in. So we will share the poll results. Close that poll and share the results. So it looks like the question to are you dealing with rebound back diffusion at your ISCO sites? We had about 51% yes, 29% a little. Uh, we had 11% what is back diffusion, and we had 9% with no. So that's a group. With that, we will hand it over to Paul and John to talk a little bit more about uh, their presentation and back diffusion. 
Let me. All right. Sorry, let us uh, go. There we go. Up here. Okay, um, so our topics today are, um, good morning, every, um, good morning, afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, Paul and I are certainly appreciate your interest and in taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, hear about our innovative ISCO application approach. Again, my name is John Yurton, and I will be uh, presenting the first portion of this presentation, and Paul will join in later and review several case studies highlighting the op optimization and evolution of this approach and, and what we have learned in implementing uh, this technology over the past 15 years. Our topics today are going to be discussing our low volume continuous oxidation injection uh, technology overview. We call it an LVCOI. Uh, we have several uh, project summaries and case studies that we're going to go through to highlight where we've seen success and also discuss a little bit of what we've learned and the opti optimization and evolution of how we've um, this approach and how we've applied uh, oxygen over the years. And then uh, we'll discuss a little bit about suitable sites and where we're seeing uh, significant success, success and, and opportunities going forward. So we'll start with the technology overview. Um, First, to get started and to address some of the issues that we are up on the poll that noted that we, what is matrix diffusion? This is a video um, from Tom Sale at, at Colorado State University. It's a, it's a video showing a release of fluorescein that goes through a, um, a contained unit of uh, clay material, a fine grain sediment, and, and more permeable uh, sediment. Uh, one thing to note. In watching this video, is how you start to see the the fluorescein diffuse into the the, the different um, or the finer grain sediments. You start to see a rind, and um, as the concentration is high in the higher permeable zones. But one thing to note, as the uh, as the fluorescein moves through, um, you can really tell that the concentration gradient continues to move into the the main part of the sediment, and uh, that even showing that when um, when the fluorescein has moved through the higher permeable zone. So um, even when contamination is or the contamination into the um, soil or groundwater matrix has stopped, we continue to see uh, diffusion of the contaminant into deeper parts of the uh, matrix. So that really highlights that uh, that um, remediation is definitely a con contact sport. I'm sure many of you have seen this this uh, this picture that in in other um, webinars. But um, the success of any in situ remedy is dependent on facilitating amend amendment contact with the contaminants. So how do you do that? How do you how do you get that treatment or treat these fine grade matrices that we highlighted in the video? Um, that's really what we're going to discuss today and focus our our discussion on highlighting how our innovative approach um, that we've been using to apply keras permanganate um, oxidants over the past 15 years at our project sites and in most in, in most cases we've seen significant success. So what is a, a, our low volume um, continuous oxidant injection? Um, it is 
The LVCO is an automated metering of low volume oxidant into multiple dedicated injection wells on a daily basis. Um, what this provides is it results in a concentrated oxygen oxidant front that expands as contaminants react with the oxidant. Um, this, highly, this creates a highly oxidative treatment zone and which expands over time as, as it reacts with the oxidant. And uh, we found that it's demonstrated the ability to overcome uh, geologic and geochemical op obstacles um, that can hinder uh, ISCO success during conventional um, batch type injections and while simultaneously reducing the potential for under or over applying oxidant. Um, this technology is versatile from site to site and adaptive um, to changing conditions, which is um, a very positive thing to have control over. Um, this, tech, this application approach was originally designed to, for remote, logistically challenged sites with limited access and infrastructure. Um, it was developed in 2008 by um, Scott Andrews uh, in partnership with one of our defense concert, contractor clients. Um, we received very uh, accolades from different regulators about how we implement uh, this approach and its innovative and, and commitment to environmental stewardship um, and how proactive it is to address some of the uh, challenges that we face uh, in matrix diffusion. Um, we currently have um, eight container systems that are currently uh, active across the U.S. We've um, constructed over 100 LV SUIs in various sizes um, over the years. One of the sites that we talk about later uh, also received the National Groundwater Association Project of the Year for uh, uh, remediation technology. Okay, so what are the operating principles? Um, developing uh, and sustaining a highly oxidating conditions in situ. Accelerate mass, dif mass diffusion from fine grain matrices and treat dissolved and, and absorb COCs in the soil matrix. Extend treatment duration and oxidant viability in the subsurface. We can deliver oxidant 365 days a year, seven days a week. Um, this technology generally relies on uh, natural oxid or natural groundwater gradients and, and different permeabilities. And um, what it also does is sustain the ma um, macro level and lateral, lateral and vertical uh, distribution of oxidant um, so we can penetrate into those lower permeable units. We can sustain oxidant in uh, fractured bedrock, which is also um, a really challenging uh, treatment environment. So where are we where are we looking? This slide is, illustrates that over um, TCE concentrations um, and also highlights different ORPs. So in highly oxidative environment, anything over 150 or 200, we start to see that we can't sustain chlorinated solvents. We call this the ox spot. This is where we want to be, and we want to maintain this this conditions in groundwater um, continuously so that we can um, reverse the concentration gradients um, in the higher permeable zones and essentially draw contaminant from the matrix. It's important to note that we um, implement significant performance monitoring programs so that we can um, monitor the success and, and how we're uh, applying these oxidants. Simply sampling VOCs every quarter or every six months or every year is not enough. We need to monitor what our, our geochemical environment is so that we can optimize um, our dosing and, and and how we apply the oxidant. 
we use uh, several things to, to do that. We use Keras to, um, we collect samples that Keras analyzes for residual permanganate so we can look at how um, oxidant consumption, how fast we're going through oxidant in a subsurface. Uh, we use, as the picture notes, um, we also use color metric monitoring to see how the oxidant is being distributed in the subsurface, both vertically and horizontally. Um, we've also developed several ways to uh, quench uh, groundwater samples with um, neutralization chemicals so that we can still see residual VOC. So it'll actually essentially stop the reaction uh, or the oxidant reaction with the with the groundwater, and we can send those samples in um, to the laboratory and get uh, real time results. What all this information leads to is really our flexibility and being able to react real time and how much we can change our dosing. We can scale it up or scale it back based on what we're seeing in um, in our uh, groundwater samples. It really allows us to tailor our approach and increase our efficiency and, and decrease costs. Um, so that's something that we really uh, rely on. Next slide. So these are just a, a few photos of some of the, oh, sorry, go back one, Paul. These are a few photos of what one of these systems looks like. Um, we can create these systems as large as in a 40-foot shipping container or um, small as a toolbox. So we have very, they're very versatile. We can scale them depending on um, access and, and limitations of site conditions. Um, certainly, we can also uh, add different uh, options on what these systems look like. This is a picture of one of the of our systems that's um, installed in a high income neighborhood park in, in central Denver. So uh, we were able to work with the city to be able to, to put one of these systems to do some source, source treatment. Um, we were designed these, these systems, we build them and, and we install them. Being able to uh, inject oxidant continuously also allows us to um, reduce mobilization, decrease costs. Uh, it also in gives us uh, increased flexibility to enhance and adjust dosing as we need to. One of the benefits of, of this technology is it also um, increases loading efficiency, reduces the use of mass-based calculators that often apply a, a confidence factor or, or a safety factor that often increases the dosing. Uh, it could you know, sometimes double, triple, or quadruple the volume of oxidant, depending on how um, unsure of the total mass within the matrix in the groundwater. This also helps us reduce the, um, the potential that we're over, overdosing or underdosing, and it reduces, in the case of overdosing, that we might uh, create secondary reactions or overoxidize you know, different minerals or, and, and not really focus in the optimal zone to address um, the, the chlorinated solvents that we're trying to address and get in contact with the oxidant. One of these, this, this system allows for increased safety. Um, it's like buying a car. You can have various options to support your site-specific needs and conditions. Um, it can be a bicycle or it can be a Bentley. It can be as low-tech or high-tech as you need. We can add uh, cloud-based monitoring for both, uh, you know, for us to monitor real-time security. Um, we have desktop monitoring and uh, dosing adjustment capabilities. 
Uh, we can make these systems simply manual, or we can apply them to uh, telemetry and, and desktop uh, controls. This is a, a platform that shows you know, some of the higher end um, monitoring that we have on, on our LVCOIs from monitoring you know, secondary containment um, to mitigate safety or uh, overflowing of our dedicated injection wells or spills. Um, we can monitor leak detection. It, it applies us a lot of remote desktop um, capabilities so that we don't have to have certain people on site uh, continuously. They're highly effective. So just summarizing what these systems and, and the technology that we're using and what we're trying to accomplish, we're developing a persistent and expanding oxidant treatment zone, um, the OxBot, as Paul likes to call it. Um, as contaminants are degraded, that uh, that treatment zone expands and and goes down gradient. We can optimize our performance between compliance events. So if we're on a semi-annual or a quarterly basis, we can adjust the dosing based on um, performance monitoring, whether it be colorimetric monitoring um, or residual permanganate analysis. Um, we can track and monitor. Um, oxidant consumption in real time so that we can make adjustments to our dosing and really optimize the application of oxidant um, throughout the, the year. Um, as I noted before, we're at, with our application of oxidant you know, continuously, we're, op we're optimizing and maintaining that oxidative environment um, in the subsurface. We can deliver oxidant into our dedicated infrastructure 365 days, seven days a week. Um, what this does is it limitates, it limits non-treatment periods, so it optimizes how we apply oxidant and how efficient we are at keeping it uh, at a certain level. So we can really drive that um, matrix uh, diffusion that uh, uh, reverse those uh, concentration gradients. It also helps reduce, if not eliminate, potential rebound. If you're maintaining a high oxidative environment, uh, you're able to really mitigate some of that potential rebound that you see in typical uh, ISCO projects where you get uh, significant declines in concentrations followed by uh, spikes in concentrations uh, due to matrix diffusion. really um, also allows for migration and, and micro penetration into those lower permeable zones and fractured bedrock. If you have a highly concentrated oxidant, always just like we saw in that video before, you can essentially drive oxidant into the matrix and you're also reversing that concentration gradient because in the, in the higher permeable zones, you're essentially clean uh, you've, you've cleaned the groundwater and concentrations will essentially reverse or gradients will reverse and really drive the contaminant out of those fine drain, grain matrices. matrices. So Paul's going to take over and, and kind of walk you through some of our uh, case studies at, at former, our former DOD facilities. and and kind of highlight some of our successes that we've see, seen in utilizing this technology and how we apply oxidant in on these uh, ISCO-specific um, in-situ remedies. Thanks, John. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, apologies for a bit of the jumping around. We uh, got a bit of a lag here with uh, our presentation. Uh, so just bear with us with that initial technical difficulty. Uh, so as John said, um, we'd like to discuss a couple of case studies uh, where we've seen some great success with our LVCOI systems. Uh, both of these sites are former DOD facilities. Um, the first is a former Army Air Base. Uh, it was, it's been around since World War II. Um, <clears throat> the primary contaminant driver was TCE. Uh, we observed concentrations between 
2,050 parts per uh, 2,000 to 51,000 uh, parts per billion. Um, we implemented a few different remedial strategies um, at this site, uh, but what we're really going to talk about is the ISCO approach and the LVCOI here. So this site, consistent with the next site we'll talk about, has a, a somewhat complex geology. Um, this site is underlain by uh, multiple progressive and regressive limestone and shale units. Um, there were three separate affected water bearing zones that, that generated a, approximately a six mile long plume. Um, as you notice, one of these, these primary limestone units pitches out. Um, so that'll be important to uh, keep in mind as we move forward here. <clears throat> so the water bearing zones here uh, are primarily one directional. Um, there is some, some westerly trends um, as well as some high spots and low spots um, in some of these source areas. So uh, the, the geology and, and the, the hydrogeology was, was a bit complex um, at the site. And so what we wanted to do was, was design and build a system specifically for the site to mitigate some of those, those challenges we were overcoming. Um, the site sits on a topographical high and is locally controlled by topography. Um, you see the groundwater elevation maps here to the right. Uh, those dark circles are TCE contours, and this data was based on uh, recent data from 2020. Uh, it's important to note here that this site also had uh, some batch injections. So uh, when we're talking about some of the, the oxidant volumes, um, another portion of the site was, was treated with batch injections. Um, so it's something to take into account, or at least just note. Um, what, what I wanted to do with this slide is, is primarily demonstrate the location of these LVCOI wells, as well as uh, some of the performance monitoring wells we're going to discuss here, where we had seen substantial reductions in TCE mass and concentration. Um, <clears throat> between 20, 2009 and 2016, um, some of our average oxidant volumes in, in our shallow most water bearing zone, about 7,500 gallons at 10%, um, with uh, that value about cut in half, uh, in the underlying water bearing zone, which we'll just call WBZ2. So we've, the majority of us have likely implemented batch ISCO injections. And I know the feeling where you're out there injecting and, and you're periodically inspecting surrounding wells and say you start to see some pink in, in a well that's 15 feet away, you, you start getting excited seeing that, that real time radius of influence and effect that your actions are having. Um, and, and not to mention, once we get 20, 30, 40 feet, you know, you're, you're really impressed with your ROIs and your coverage. I wanna start showing you some examples where we need to be thinking in the hundreds and thousands of feet for ROIs with these systems. So we're gonna look at a couple monitoring wells trend graphs, uh, similar to the ones we have up here. Um, as we work through these graphs, uh, they're located further and further away from the LVCOI in the source area. So what we're looking at on these graphs are these vertical purple bars that represent periods of ISCO injection and, and application. Uh, the white spaces between them are present because this system did not run in the winter months. Uh, that was because the system was designed to operate on solar and uh, just due to the remote nature of the site. Um, and as you can see from the, the data trends here, uh, the, the data is relatively consistent prior to any treatment. This first, ver this first green vertical line is our initial oxidant loading event. We can see some reductions pretty, pretty quickly after that point, uh, but then we start to see a little bit of rebound. Um, as we continue our oxidant injections um, with these periods of application and non-application, uh, we, could, we could see some rebounds early in this process, but as soon as we overcame that concentration gradient, we seen quite a, a precipitous decline in concentration. Uh, this, also, this data also correlates well with uh, some of our ORP data here on the chart to the right. Uh, this chart plots TCE, chlorine, manganese, and, and these various blue colors. Uh, our gray is a groundwater elevation, but what we really want to focus on is the, the ORP or the green lines. And you can see after a, 
a period of time and overcoming that concentration gradient, we were able to maintain these highly persistent oxidative zones. Uh, here's another uh, another performance monitoring well. This well is 06A. Uh, this well is located uh, 117 feet from the LVCOI system. Um, again, pretty consistent concentrations prior to treatment. Um, following the initial loading, we see a bit of rebound. We also see a little bit of rebound during these intermittent periods. But once we overcome that concentration gradient, those TCE values precipitously decline and are basically maintained at non detect. Our second graph to the right here also depicts us maintaining our highly oxidative state after only a few uh, injection events and, and or continuous operation of the system in a relatively short period of time. And again, this well is 117 feet away from our LVCOI. Uh, here's well 08A. I'd like to call this one out because it's uh, over 1,300 feet from the LVCOI system. That's over four football fields long. So again, our data TCE trends to the left are relatively consistent in which we've seen elevated consistent concentrations prior to treatment. Uh, we've seen a little bit of uh, rebound following the loading and, and after these periods of non-operation. But again, once we overcome the concentration gradient, we see quite a precipitous decline. Um, this well has a little bit more rebound, um, and that's just due to its distance away from the LVCOI. So these, these, this bit of a delay in, in not only the concentration drops, but also the, the ORP values, or once we achieve some, some highly oxidative conditions, uh, this delay is a result of us attacking the source and cutting the head off the snake. So these down gradient dissolved phase TCE concentrations, once the source is removed, decrease before we really see influence from the injections and, and that's represented by not only color but increased ORP. The last well we want to discuss at this site is MW34A. This well was 20 over 2700 feet away from the LVCOI system. That is over a half a mile away. That is for perspective half the distance between sea level and the elevation of Denver. So again, um, we do see some re rebound with the sawtooth pattern in the data. Uh, but once we've overcome, which we really kind of have not entirely overcome the concentration gradient, we begin to see some pretty precipitous and sustained declines in TCE concentration. Uh, we also see a bit of a sawtooth pattern with our, our ORP values. If this system was running during the winter months, we could have further compressed this remedial timeline. And so this goes to the flexibility of these systems and, and how we can adapt them or modify them to suit your site needs. If, for instance, this site was more driven by a remedial timeline, we would, an option would be to install a dedicated uh, power system as opposed to solar and run the system continuously. So, what, what did operating that system do and what did all those trend graphs show us as it relates to the plume? So I'd, I'd like to just show a little bit of a video um, and maybe just call out some of the, the, the fly-ins here to help explain. So here's a plume that was, was identified in the late 90s, early 2000s uh, characterization had, has shown this plume to be over six miles long. What flew in was a small source area excavation in 2005. We'll then start to see some of our remedial infrastructure flying into place here. And that is in the form of the installation of uh, dedicated injection wells. We can see a lot of the, the primary source area heavy mass, the, the dark browns, the reds, the greens in the center of the plume have dissipated. Some supplemental infrastructure went in and we basically bisected the plume. Continued source treatment uh, reduced the plume on site even further while 
not only the treatment, but some supplemental forces have reduced the area of the uh, tail end of the plume. And that was more or less all achieved in a matter of, let's say 2009 to 2016, so six, seven years. Uh, that, that's pretty impressive results. A six, seven year batch program would have been much more intensive and, and costly. Our second DOD site is a former Air Force base. Um, it was in operation a little prior to World War II up and through the 90s. Uh, a multitude of contaminants were identified on site, but our primary driver for our purposes is TCE. Concentrations were observed between 5,000 and half a million parts per billion. This site also underwent numerous remediation strategies um, through excavation disposal, a lot of ISCO direct push programs, um, and, and most of those took place in the 2000, early 2000s into the mid 2010s. So our LVCOI didn't get put in place until 2019. And that's what we're gonna talk about here moving forward. So consistent with the other site, this site had a pretty, I don't wanna say complex geology, but unique geology. Um, this area was characterized by various paleo channels and paleo valleys that were more or less carved into the bedrock surface. <clears throat> these more per, uh, there are more permeable materials overlying these paleo channels and valleys bounding bedrocks, and these systems we identified as as bounding and conveying our contaminant plume, almost acting as a transport superhighway. There were very low hydraulic conductivities and gradients within the bedrock aquifer, so the primary primary distribution method was through the alluvium. The alluvium was more or less a, a coarse grain material with incontiguous fine grain units that were primed for absorption and back diffusion, making batch injections or direct push injections impractical due to continuous mobilizations. Um, this alluvium is also discontinuously saturated and is basically driven uh, as a result of the alluvium thickness and the bedrock elevations in these areas. So out of that three plus mile long plume that uh, was generated along that paleo channel, there were a couple recalcitrant source areas. Um, and the one that was the most problematic exhibiting TCE in the bedrock water bearing zone up to almost a quarter of a million uh, parts per million. The alluvium was a, an order of magnitude or two less than that. Uh, but this is the, the area where we designed and installed this LMCOI to address the, these concentrations. So the, the design concept was not only to attack the source material that, that was identified as present in the bedrock, but also to figure out a way to mitigate any recontamination of areas we've already cleaned up down gradient, and specifically in the alluvium as the primary transport method. So what we decided to do was install an oxidant barrier within the alluvium down gradient of our source area. We most acted as an oxidant curtain to catch any potential escaping mass uh, from the bedrock, the bedrock system. Uh, this, just to note, this uh, map is also showing some borehole heat exchange wells uh, that we have installed out here and paired with the system, which we'll talk about here a little bit later. So we got a couple charts up about the volumes of 10% we've been able to apply using the LVCOI at the site. The chart on the left breaks down the 10% sodium permanganate volume by year and also by well. Well, the chart to the right is, is a, a total value by, uh, by year. So we, we started this system in November, 2020. And typically we've been doing about 3,500 gallons of 10% a year. Uh, in total, we're just under 10,000 gallons uh, for that roughly three-year period. These are generally low volumes for an ESCO program, uh, especially one with these initial source concentrations we observed. That said, with low oxidant volumes, let's talk about some of our data trends. So what we're seeing here are two, two uh, graphs that chart 
uh, not only ORP, but residual permanganate analysis, or in essence, oxidant concentration, uh, with, with time charted on the bottom. Um, some, I have some markers in here to, to just help identify what some of these vertical bars mean uh, in relation to some of the LBCOI starts and stops in our uh, um, initial loading. Uh, these, these blue lines are heavy precipitation events. So what we see here is in essence, not only a elevated oxidant concentration in this area, but also these elevated and sustained ORPs that are around the 700 millivolt range. The residual permanganate analysis is, is telling us we're, we're pretty close in line with, with and even above our, our target uh, dosing concentration of roughly 1%. Um, here is a same data trend table. This is for one of our alluvium monitoring wells that is down gradient of the LVCOI, and specifically that, uh, that uh, LVCOI oxidant barrier. Um, it, it's about 110 feet down gradient, and this well is routinely purple, exhibiting the presence of a high presence of sodium permanganate. Again, uh, some initial oxidant loading. We have an LVCOI start that nearly immediately maintains a very highly oxidative environment with ORPs over 600 millivolts. We also have a residual permanganate trend that's stable and it's just under one tenth of a percent of oxidant. What is important to note about these is, as we looked at these last trend graphs, is that this system allows you the flexibility to individualize your injections for each individual monitoring well. So you can really meter your injection volumes to address current conditions that may change as a result of your ongoing treatment. And again, the, the goal of these systems is really to maintain a highly oxidated environment within your target zones continuously and sustained. Two more trend graphs for us here. Um, this is one uh, or two of monitoring wells that are located in the source area. Uh, one is screened to the left in the alluvium and the one to the right is screened in the bedrock. They're, they're generally pretty close to the LVCOI injection wells, only 10 and 15 feet away. Um, they're kind of like paired wells, but what you see, what sticks out in these these trend graphs is initially the sawtooth pattern of these TCE concentrations. So these are things that we expect. A lot of ISCO programs, you see this, for lack of a better term, what looks like rebound, which is some contribution, but it is also some other factors that will come up. So the reason we're seeing some of these sawtooth patterns in this data set is a result of some of these initial oxidant loading and application methods. So we initially approached this with a hydrogen peroxide uh, loading event just to remove all the chlorinated ethanes and really use our LVCOI system to target the ethenes that are, are really persistent and ongoing problem here. So we have our LVCOI start and we start to see um, <clears throat> some of this data prior to that increasing. And that's just the result of us, in essence, mixing the system up with these oxidant batch injections, whether it was the uh, peroxide or the, the permanganate. Um, these systems are transient, or these, these uh, spikes are transient and, and, and tend to decrease pretty rapidly. Um, and, and as you can see, once we, we start this LVCOI, we, we see a pretty precipitous drop. Um, we see another spike here towards the tail end of the data, and that's a result of the system um, starting and stopping. We also do some supplemental efforts like freshwater pushes to help propagate and distribute the oxidant that may already be in the ground, just not migrating as a result of this specific bedrock environment where uh, groundwater gradients are very low, conductivities are low, and transport velocities are quite low. 
So similar graph, last one, I promise. Similar graph of another monitoring well. This is uh, actually two monitoring wells. Both of them are in the alluvium. Um, one of these is about 52, 42 feet from the LVCOI. The other one is uh, a well we previously discussed on the down gradient side of our oxidant barrier, about 110 feet. Um, what you see uh, is a very similar uh, sawtooth trend here in one of these wells off the front once we do our mixing, but these concentrations basically flatten out and stay pretty low persistently. So the, the takeaway from this site is that oxidant is present in these downgradial, downgradient alluvial monitoring wells, demonstrating that our oxidant curtain is effective and, and, and is present. Uh, the highly oxidative bedrock in alluvial aquifers uh, that are maintaining ORPs above 500 milligram, uh, millivolts using a, a relatively small volume of oxidant annually, less than 5,000 gallons. We also employed supplemental strategies at this site, such as a, a thermal in situ sustainable remediation system that uh, Arcadis holds a patent for. Uh, we work with them on mostly bio and, and ERD sites uh, with these systems to help increase the kinetics and, and foster microbial population. Uh, this was the first one we've used at an at a, uh, ESCO site. And we'll talk a little bit uh, about some of the trends and, and data that that system has generated for us. We also tend to induce gradients within that bedrock aquifer to help increase migration and propagate the oxidant, as well as those freshwater pushes. Again, uh, here's a color evaluation that we like to do with these sites that really help us understand distribution and degree. Um, you can see our oxygen curtain here, and then our one down gradient monitoring well, or one of two, that uh, exhibits quite a bit of oxygen. And that kind of brings us into how we've optimized and evolved these technologies over time. So some of the equipment and materials we've used are, are telemetry systems. Um, and again, you know, back to John's point, this can be a bicycle or it could be a Bentley. It could be as high tech or as low tech as you want it. It can meet your sustainability objective, objectives through solar, or you can use a direct dedicated power supply so the system's continuously running. And that's not to say that because it's on solar, it cannot run continuously. Those two things are not related. Uh, you can also have both power supplies. Um, we've also used these uh, with alternative amendments such as ZBI, or carbohydrates, and pH buffers. And then we've also employed a lot of secondary and supplemental strategies such as SVE systems and this thermal in situ remediation system. Uh, it's in essence a residential solar powered water heater that cycles and distributes a glycol um, water mixture to increase the temperature. Uh, what was on the previous photo were uh, the heat exchange well, uh, coils around one of the walls during fabrication. So this tisser system, these, these are pretty low cost and it, and it really helped us um, with this site in increasing some of the kinetics by raising the temperatures anywhere from two to five degrees. Other sites where bio is employed, we've, we've seen these temperature increases even higher. So what's what's an LVCOI suitable site? Um, you know, does this, is this technology right for you? Um, how do you usually impress your clients? I mean, things work, concentrations decrease, the regulators are, are pleased, but one thing we can all agree on is reducing project remedial timelines and environmental reserve amounts is a huge plus for, for your clients and demonstrating to them that you're looking out for their best interests. Um, some of these other ways are you know, accelerating your closure timeline. Um, reducing your insurance coverage durations because that cleanup deadline is accelerated. Lower your overall project costs and increase safety and in turn you and your clients liability exposure. So how do we do that? How do we impress our clients? How do we meet all these objectives of reducing timelines, et cetera? How do you become a trusted advisor? So Employing these systems is a great way to do that because it, it demonstrates that flexibility and adaptability. But what, where are these sites suitable? I guess anywhere you might have a concern for this. So 
we've deployed these sites at, at varying types of sites, or these systems at varying types of sites. Um, some of these characteristics of these sites are in contiguous or continuous fine grain units, um, sites where you have a rebound problem, fractured bedrock environments, or sites that are long-term and fiscally sensitive, um, and there's limited resources annually to implement batch injections or some other technology. These systems are also typically deployed at sites that are logistically complicated or where you have access issues. Um, we've retrofitted existing buildings and rooms. Um, and it, more importantly, like the picture we had of a site in Denver, right in the middle of a park in a pretty high income neighborhood, any site you have public safety concerns or are sensitive, you know, these are enclosed systems. You know, the public doesn't see people walking around, you know, mixing chemicals and doing batch injections. Um, we've, we've also seen these systems with a 99% uptime and we've had no failure rates. I do want to say there have been a few attempts of reverse engineering these and they did not go well. Um, so it has been tried and it has failed. Um, we'd be happy to discuss this with, with anyone. We'd be happy to, to talk more about these systems in detail and your site specific needs. And I guess that will kind of bring us into some of our general questions. But if you do want to discuss more about these, you could always reach out to Weaver Consultants Group on the web uh, or via email, as well as Keras, as we work and partner very closely with Keras. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, Dylan, if you've got any questions, I, I think we've got eight minutes or so, we can um, go ahead and answer a few. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, John and Paul. That was that was great. Always really interesting to see uh, see the work you guys have done. We do have a couple questions. I'll give it a little bit more for any more to come in. I'll try to combine some of these to answer multiples at once. Uh, the first one is looking at case study one. Uh, did the TCE migrate through the shale layers to get to the deepest limestone layer? John is the, the geologist. I might let you answer. <laughs> uh, yes. So those those um, geologic units are in communication. One of the things that we did early on uh, was do a tracer study so that we could identify the the fate and transport of uh, the contaminants and how they uh, interacted between the the water bearing zones, uh, which are particularly the limestones and the non water bearing zones, which were the the shale units. So we did uh, that tracer study, which determined that they were in communication, and and we did see um, contaminants migrate from from the upper uh, limestone unit into the two limestone units below. But we did see significant reduction in concentrations um, in the lower units. But we did uh, we part of our injection strategy was to uh, inject in both of those or all three of those units so that we could mitigate any propagation of, of those contaminants off-site. All right, history. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another one we have is, um, so the, the range in the systems you're talking about, the bicycle for the Bentley, do you have an estimated cost, understanding that it might be a range there for, for these systems? It, it's it's hard to say. Um, they're they're so site dependent. Um, and a big driver behind these systems is not only the capital cost, but you know the, the cost of the chemical. So you know we can make these as complex as John said in an 80 foot container with you know a dozen, two dozen injection wells, or they can be as small as a toolbox sitting in a well vault. Um, so they're it's really hard to to nail that down. Um, but I'll let John speak to maybe some generalities. Yeah, certainly the, more, yeah, certainly the more yeah, certainly the more complex and options you pick for how these systems operate, and particularly in relation to um, whether those systems want to run, you know, throughout the year and and what climate they're running in. Um, you know, the one the one site that we showed um, that's in Denver, that one runs you know, 365 days a year. So we added some, you know, options to that container where it's insulated, it, it has a heat, it has heat, 
they'd have dedicated um, power. So um, the systems themselves, um, you know, can be, I would say, 20 to 40 grand. But when you add the infrastructure and whatever things you need to support them and all the options, it's, it's very similar to, to what a, um, you know, when you're out buying a car, the more things that you add to it and the more options you add and the more telemetry you add and, and functionality, you know, obviously the costs go up and, and um, because you're adding different things that might need full-time full power. So then you have to get a power supply and a, and a dedicated um, power meter um, connection to, you know, the grid. So as you add on things and you add on functionality, certainly, you know, the prices go up just like with everything else um, that you buy. Hopefully that was some, um, provided some context. Thank you. Uh, another one on kind of geology side, how do you find and delineate the paleo channel? So, <laughs> yeah, so the paleo channel um, was identified during, for that particular site through installing hundreds of wells during the remedial investigation that was done by um, the Air Force during the characterization of that particular site. So uh, every well that was put in has a, uh, gets logged and it taps bedrock so they get elevations, they can produce a bedrock uh, elevation map. And a lot of those through the density of a number of wells that were put in, that's how those um, um, PO channels were identified. And certainly the other thing that depicts how the paleo channel and the shape of the plume was where we're where we were identifying contamination versus we, where we weren't and typically when you see long and skinny plumes um, there there are some geologic constraints to why uh, the contaminants don't disperse in a wider you know fashion between the first site you saw we did see a, quite a bit of dispersion as it went out um, because it was going from different water brain zones. Um, and there wasn't a paleo channel versus the second site that we looked at. Um, the plume was very um, laterally limited and extended for a long, you know, a long way. So there were other physical controls that were also uh, mitigating where the contaminants ended up going and helped define what that paleo channel um, looked like. All right, thank you. And we got time for one more, and I'm going to kind of merge a handful of questions together we have regarding injection concentration, loading, and design. So part one is what is a, a typical injection concentration? And then kind of off of that, you guys shared a, a picture earlier of uh, the Keras uh, design tool. Um, how do you guys typically determine loading and performance uh, for, for a site? So it's kind of a two-part. Yeah. So. Typically what we've looked at and through our experience that um, we want to be in a little a, a sweet spot as far as our concentration of, of, of amendment. Um, depending on the concentrations we're trying to address, whether it's a source area or, or um, just the part of the plume where we're injecting, um, if we're just targeting dissolved phase or we're targeting dissolved phase and um, contaminants that are locked up in uh, immobile pore spaces or matrix, um, in the soil uh, or the saturated soil, we want to be within that 10 to 20 percent, 10 to 15 percent uh, concentration by volume of, um, for, for particularly for sodium permanganate. Um, once you get over that 15 to 20 percent, you start oxidizing other other things in the environment, metals and um, and so a lot of those things that we look at um, determine what that concentration is. So we don't want to over oxidize the environment because then we start basically wasting oxidant because you're oxidizing minerals instead of um, the target contaminant. Uh, we also utilize something that Keras does for us where we do um, you know, PNOD sampling where we go in and look at 
permanganate, permanganate oxidant divan, both in, um, in groundwater and soil, which also tell, helps us determine what that, um, what that demand is in the, on the organic spectrum. If it's, you know, what, just the base load of oxidant that was going to need to address those content, you know, the, the organics in the subsurface plus the, cont the, the contaminant. So we use, uh, utilize some uh, Keras's lab to, to kind of put um, limitations on what that uh, mass looks like and what, what, what the, what's going to drive the dosing. Yeah, and I, and I think the other part of that question too is about the Keras calculator. Was that right, Dylan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so those are super important and powerful tools. Um, and if you're doing batch injections and a lot of other application methods, you really have to do that. You have to understand and convey to your client, how much oxygen am I probably gonna need over this five, 10, 15 year period to really destroy all this contaminant um, in the contaminant mass. So, uh, in, and to John's point about the PNOD testing, that's actually one of the items on that, that calculator and, and it really governs how much oxygen you really need at your site. If, if you don't collect that data and you make an assumption, I mean, you could be off by an order of magnitude. Um, so they, they are very important. Just with how these systems operate and apply oxidant, they're not necessarily needed because we don't need to calculate a volume to destroy a certain amount of mass in one shot. We are continuously injecting oxidant and really just maintaining that highly oxidative state in the aquifer um, instead of big batch injection, Let's hope this is enough, you know, and then you basically set it and forget it and, and monitor and see what happens. Um, we have a lot more flexibility. So just some of those tools, you know, they're, they're good in the very upfront early stages, but as the project duration goes on, they're just less needed. All right. Well, thank you both so much. It looks like we're, we're out of time. Uh, there's some contact information up on the page if you want to reach out to the CARES or the Weaver team. Um, and also this recording will be available uh, later on Karis's YouTube page. So if anyone wants to see the recording and rewatch any of this, they are, they are welcome to. All right. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great rest of the day.